It's time to think about the Bible like you never have before. This is Christian Questions. After this episode, go to ChristianQuestions.com to check out other episodes, Bible study resources, videos, download the CQ app, and more. Today's topic is, what is truth? Coming up in this episode, Jesus said that his followers would know the truth and the truth would make them free. That sounds exciting and refreshing, but what does it really mean? And what about everybody talking about my truth? Can my truth be the same as the truth? Here's Rick and Jonathan. Welcome, everyone. I'm Rick. I'm joined by Jonathan, my co-host, for over 20 years. And Jonathan, what's our theme scripture for this episode? Psalm 119, 160, from the New Living Translation. The very essence of your words is truth. All your just regulations will stand forever. We would all agree that truth is important. Legally, we know it's critical. When, when you're pressed to speak the truth under oath in the United States, you're asked, do you solemnly swear or affirm that you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God, or under pains and penalties of perjury? As important as this sounds, we as human beings are often lazy about truth and even afraid of it. Winston Churchill once said, men occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. So what is truth? Are there absolute truths? How can we know which truths are reliable and which ones are merely situational? So to begin our discussion of truth, let's look at the context of Pilate's famous what is truth question. Let's get some background. Jesus had just gone through a sleepless night of harsh, illegal, and corrupt treatment by the Pharisees. They had only one objective, to be rid of him before he took away their power and their influence. After three nighttime and pre-dawn trials, the Pharisees dragged Jesus before their governor, Pilate, and they vehemently accused him. Pilate questioned him, but found no guilt. The Pharisees complained, so Pilate summoned Jesus into the praetorium with him for a private conversation. And praetorium is a different kind of word, and in the Roman history it means a headquarters or residence of a Roman official, governor, or military commander. So he's brought to the inside for a private conversation. Now this conversation would tell the story of two men and the search for truth. One man in this story was overwhelmed with difficult questions and pressure as he sought out truth. Though accused, the other man, Jesus, was calm and strong in the truth that he spoke and in the truth that he lived. So let's look at this account as an overview for this question, what is truth? Let's look at John chapter 18. We're going to start with verses 33 and 34. Therefore, Pilate entered again into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? Well, even though Jesus was the defendant, he questioned Pilate as to his own knowledge and findings. And and Rick, that wasn't supposed to happen. Pilate just wanted an answer. He didn't want to be questioned. Yeah, you know, you wonder how many people would have had the, the, the courage to do that, and yet Jesus, in that calmness, just asked him that question. But here's the thing. We're looking at Pilate as he is trying to find truth. Finding truth requires having a clear mind and acting on that clarity. So Pilate is attempting to set that as his context, to have a clear mind and to act on that clarity. Well, Pilate was impatient, needed answers, so he directly asked Jesus to explain himself in the next verse, John 18, 35. Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? Well, Pilate was saying, you better defend yourself. This is serious. Yeah, so he again, he's looking to find truth. Finding truth requires asking the right questions. What have you done? I need to get to the bottom of this. So you can see that he's essentially heading down the right path to find truth. Now, Jesus' answer was directed more toward Pilate's first question, but he assured Pilate along the way that he was not a political rebel. We find this in John 18, 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. 
If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Well, Jesus still didn't answer Pilate's question, but instead he told Pilate he was no threat to Rome. So he gave Pilate information that was very important to Pilate as he's seeking truth. And what this tells us is that finding truth, again, following Pilate's lead here, and it's unusual for us to say, hey, we're going to follow Pilate's lead. But we're looking at what he's doing, and, there, and there's great value in it. Finding truth requires listening carefully to the details. That's what it requires. You've got to listen carefully to details. You have to have a clear mind. You have to ask the right questions, and you have to listen carefully to the details. Let's go on further with this account in John eighteen thirty seven. Therefore, Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. For this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. So Pilate said, You are a king, but you're not a threat to Rome. This is very different from the Pharisees' accusations. So he's following along, and he's locating truth by asking and he's actually listening this is good again finding truth finding truth requires processing those details with integrity and wisdom and we can see Pilate is really working at doing that but Jesus said some things in the end of that last comment that caused Pilate to have a kind of a different reaction because Jesus said everyone who is of the truth hears my voice what's John eighteen thirty eight say Pilate said to him what is truth and there you have the big question. Finding truth requires accepting the clear facts and acting on them in righteousness. So Pilate, at the end, at the conclusion, is a little bit confused. And that's why he asks, what is truth? You know, some commentaries say, well, that was, that was you know, a little bit sarcastic. I think it was literally, this is a hard thing. This is a hard position I'm in. You're saying people who follow truth follow you, but you know these people out there who are supposed to be upstanding citizens are trying to get you <laughs> taken off the scene. So he's in, he's in a very difficult scenario right here, Pilate is. But we've seen him trying to track down truth. So let's look at that. Let's look at tracking truth. What do we have so far? Most journeys towards truth are a search that is riddled with preconceived ideas and expectations. Finding truth in this way easily results in watering down what we find to suit what we prefer. Let our searching for the truth be based not on compromise, but on humility and integrity. See, it's easy to try to find truth when we're trying to fill in the gaps of our preconceived ideas. We're not going to find truth. We're going to find comfort. And that's not what this is really all about. We're talking about truth. So, with all of this said, the word for truth is a very general and very broadly wor used word in the New Testament. Jonathan, tell us about that word a little bit. Well, it simply means truth. Hmm. And it comes from a word which means true as not concealing. So, it's like something is open and revealed. So, it's very vague, essentially. It's very, yes. very, very general. So, how do we understand that? Let's look at several ways this word for truth is used in the New Testament. We're going to give you several examples of different uses to get a sense of what it means in different circumstances, and it really helps us understand that the context is going to tell us what kind of meaning we need to put on this word. So let's look at the first example of truth. Truth as in telling the whole factual story. Let's look at Mark 5, 31 to 34. And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd pressing in on you, and you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. So this woman was afraid and she was called out. She sought healing. She just, her faith said, touch the hem of his garment. That's all I need to do. And Jesus had great compassion. But she spilled the whole truth because she was afraid. And Jonathan, this reminds me of raising our children, our, our, our three children. You know, 
kids get into all kinds of issues and then they have all kinds of tr- uh, troubles deciding what do I tell mom and dad and what do I keep from mom and dad? You know, and <laughs> it's not necessarily an easy thing. One of the rules that we really worked at when our kids were younger was a rule of truth. And the rule went something like this. Okay, things happen in life. If you tell us the truth, we will not be angry no matter what it is that happened. We'll deal with it, but we won't be angry. But if you lie and we find out the truth later, uh, that may be a different story. And the point was draw the truth out so that you can deal with the truth and not just deal with that one circumstance, but create a habit of putting the truth first. Uh, You know, that's the kind of thing that we want to look at as we look at what is truth. Telling the whole story, that was a good example of that. Let's look at the next example of truth. Truth as in a foundational precept that can be confidently built upon. And this next scripture takes place when Peter was sent to Cornelius and his family to proclaim the good news to the Gentiles. Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of or upon a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. So it's an interesting formation of words. He says, upon a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. What he's saying is, I have seen with my own eyes what a vision has shown me before. And upon this truth, I understand that God is not limiting the gospel only to the Jewish nation. There's something far bigger than I ever thought possible. And he saw it, and he recognized it upon this truth, upon this foundational precept that I've seen with my own eyes. And Peter was given the keys to the kingdom in that way. He opened the door for the Gentiles because he was given that vision and that experience of the foundational precept of truth. Let's look at another example of how truth is used. Truth as in something greater and more comprehensive than the law of Moses. Now this sounds odd, but... Let, let's go to the scripture. John chapter 1, verse 17. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So you can look at that and say, wait, so the law of Moses wasn't true? No, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying, the law was given by Moses, but grace and the bigger truth, the comprehensive truth, was given by Jesus Christ. It was built upon the law, and it showed us something much, much more significant, and we'll get to this later on in the podcast. So truth as in something greater and more comprehensive than even the law of Moses. It just gives you a sense of, wow, there's a height and and, and, and a strength there that's really hard to comprehend. The next use, truth. Truth as in something that is genuine and pure. Ephesians 4.24. And that ye put on the new man, which after God has created in righteousness and true holiness. True holiness. Okay, genuine holiness, pure holiness versus pseudo holiness versus partial holiness, true holiness. It gives you the sense of this is something big and comprehensive. And, and like you said before, something that's not concealed. It's very, very opened up and clear to everybody who sees it. So true as in genuine and pure. Let's look at another example. And you can see how many ways this word is used in, this, in the shades of meaning, but there's a profound aspect with each one of them. The next example, truth. Truth as in the full integrity of the pure message. And that's in Galatians 2.14. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Well, Paul was questioning Peter and telling him not to be hypocritical. Right. So he's saying they didn't walk according to the truth, according to the full integrity and the full purity of the message. So you see truth has that aspect to it. And our final example, uh, and there, there are others, but our final example for this podcast, truth, uh, truth as in the length and the breadth and the height and the depth of God's will and word. And John eight thirty two tells us that. And ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And as our regular listeners know, for almost 25 years, Christian Questions has shared the good news for all based on the ransom sacrifice of Jesus. There is a freeing because 
God has everyone's best interest in mind. There is no fear attached to truth. That's a beautiful way to put it. There is no fear attached to absolute truth, to God's truth. And we, inf- as we go through this podcast, we will unfold that specific thought. So with all that we've already seen, one thing is already obvious. We need to set ourselves on a path of seeking truth, even at our own expense. If truth should be of such high value, how do we handle it when so many of us are focusing on my truth? Ah, now we go, now we're getting into something here. This is a massive issue as the idea that each of us can create, adopt, and proclaim our own irrefutable truth has become mainstream. Instead of exchanging thoughts, experiences, ideas, and deeply held beliefs, we now announce our truth and therefore expect respect and unequivocal acceptance. This not only breaks our ability to communicate, it severs us from seeking and holding higher truth. And Jonathan, before we go through this, I just want want to repeat one thing. Instead of exchanging thoughts, experiences, ideas, and deeply held beliefs, what do we do now? We now announce our truth, and therefore we expect respect, and we expect unequivocal acceptance. Something is wrong with that picture. And this has a lot to do with something called situation ethics. Webster's New World College Dictionary, Jonathan, situation ethics, what what do they say? Well, situation ethics is defined as a theory of ethics according to which moral rules are not absolutely binding, but may be modified in the light of specific situations. So we look at that and say, wow, does that sound like the world in which we live or what? Let's go to a soundbite from Prager University. Uh, This was from a YouTube video entitled, There Is No Such Thing As Your Truth. It's an interesting, interesting take on this. Increasingly, people speak of my truth or say it's true for me or your reality, as though truth is merely a matter of opinion or perspective. At the 2018 Golden Globe Awards, Oprah Winfrey famously said that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have. Now, you can have your experience or your perspective, but there's no such thing as your truth or my truth. There is only the truth, that which is true for everyone. As Wall Street Journal writer Byron Tao noted, Oprah employed a phrase that I've noticed a lot of other celebrities using these days, your truth instead of the truth. But he added, your truth undermines the idea of shared common facts. And here's another problem with your truth. If your truth is truth, anyone who doesn't hold that truth must be wrong. This sounds a lot like narcissism, and it's intellectual bullying. Believe my truth or else. And Jonathan, there's some very powerful thoughts here. You know, the idea of shared common facts are now thrown out the window when I proclaim my truth. And people can say, but it's true to me, and therefore it's my truth. I get that. But what you're really saying is, this is a deeply held belief that I have. And there's a big difference between expressing a deeply held belief and demanding people hear you as though you are speaking truth because it's my truth and that's the end of that. This is, sounds like a new phenomenon, but it really isn't. This has been around for a long time. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees were, unfortunately, a great example of this. We're going to look at two pointed examples of the Pharisees looking to claim, quote, unquote, their truth at the expense of the truth. Our first example, we're going to look at a a, a circumstance where they use the title of teaching and adhering to truth as bait for deception. So they push this title out there and they give it to Jesus as though he's something special in their eyes, but that's not really their motivation. Listen to this account very carefully. This is Matthew 22, verses 15 to 22, but let's do 15 to 17 to start. Then the Pharisees went and plotted together how they might trap him in what he said. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and teach the way of God in truth and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. Tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give a poll tax to Caesar or not? Now think about the way the scripture is written. They plot together how they might trap him. 
And they go to him and say, teacher, oh, you're so truthful, and you teach the way of truth. Do you want to really trap somebody who you believe believes that? I don't think so. This was just putting out bait. Here's the thing. You got to ask the question when they're doing that, when they're saying that, what was their truth? Well, they were threatened and laid out a trap to ease that threat. That was their truth. We need to push this guy aside. Let's play on his ego. Of course, Jesus didn't have an ego. They didn't know that. Let's play on his ego so we can get rid of him. Let's go back to the verses and see how Jesus responds. Verses 18 through 22 of Matthew 22. But Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Then render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And hearing this, they were amazed, and leaving him, they went away. Well, first, Jesus called them out. And second, Jesus answered so thoroughly that they were stunned. All right, they were. It was a stunning answer they would have never saw coming. But here's the question, Jonathan. What was their truth? They had no answer, but they also did not alter their truth. And they're like little children with fingers in their ears saying, nope, I'm not listening. You can't (laughs) contradict my truth. We'll think of another way to get you. And they worked on it, and they worked on it. But see, their truth was, okay, we have no answer. It didn't alter their pattern, because their truth was, we can't answer him, so let's get out of here, and let's, let's regroup so we can come after him again. This is not a truth that's based in absolute truth. This is a truth that's based in evil and pride and selfishness and all of those things. So let's go to our second example. That was the first example. The second example very soon after Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead. Now, this is near the end of Jesus' ministry. Very soon after that event, and he raised Lazarus by the power of God's Spirit, the situation that the Pharisees faced brought their ethics, their truths, to a very dramatic point. John 11, 47 to 51, and then verse 53. Let's just do 47 and 48 to start. Therefore, the chief priests and the Pharisees convened a council and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, all men will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Well, let's review, Rick. Jesus performed an amazing miracle, and they had evil and selfish motives because of that? It doesn't make sense. So let me ask you the question. What then was their truth? They had to stop Jesus. That was their truth. They ignored the bigger picture because their truth had its agenda. You see how our truth can count, uh, contradict the truth and create such havoc, and it gets worse. Let's look at verses 49 and to, to 51. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all, nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish? Now he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And it almost sounds like, well, he prophesied this was a really good thing. He was being really bold and honest and, and upfront. But let, let's look at, read a, a commentary from Albert Barnes on this what it means that he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. And it's on not of himself. Though he uttered what proved to be true prophecy, yet it was accomplished in a way which did not intend. He did not intend. He had a wicked design. He was plotting murder and crime, yet wicked as he was and little as he intended it, God so ordered it that he delivered a most precious truth respecting the atonement. God can use evil for good. There was no goodness in Caiaphas's prophesying here. He's saying, let's get rid of him. I'm the high priest. I am speaking. So what's the result of this conversation? Verse 53 of John 11. So from that day on, they plan together to kill him. And Jonathan, I don't have to ask you what their truth is because that's, it's, it's stated plainly right there. 
They it were, really is. They're out to get him. They're, the fact that he raised a man, think about that. He raised a man from the dead by God's spirit who was dead for four days, and they want to take this life <laughs> restorer and take his life from him. You can't get further from the truth. What was their truth here? Their truth had degraded them to plotting the murder of an innocent man, like you said. It just doesn't fit. Let's go back to another soundbite that helps us to, to put this into a little bit more perspective of my truth versus the, the truth. This is from Evangelism Explosion, a, uh, a YouTube video, uh, Reasonable Answers to Your Truth is Not My Truth. Well, first, let me define a few terms. One, absolute truth, and two, values. Absolute truth is something that exists without being dependent upon anything else, things like good and evil. We do not need to believe in absolute truth for it to be true. Conversely, values deal with the importance, worth, or usefulness placed on something, things like creativity, helpfulness, and beauty. Values exist inside of a culture while truth exists apart from it. The problem comes when we replace absolute truth with values. And that's the problem. We replace absolute truth with values. Values are from within. Absolute truth is from without. It's bigger than us. It's, it's before us. It's after us. It's around us, but we don't necessarily have to see it. And here's the thing about absolute truth. People seem to deny the existence of absolute truth, as the denial seems to give them freedom to think or say or do whatever they might feel or personally believe. However, isn't the denial of absolute truth existing a proclamation of what they believe to be an absolute truth? Let me give you an example. Jonathan, I'm here to tell you there is no absolute truth. Uh, are you sure, Rick? I am sure. How can, how can you be so sure? I am sure. There is no absolute absolute truth. There is my truth, there are other people's truths, and we have to respect them. Well, didn't you just tell me an absolute truth? And see, that's the problem. When we get so so emotional about defending my truth, what we're saying is we are, we are presenting the fact that absolute truth exists. By denying it, we present it. And the thing is, absolute truth is bigger than us. So let's talk about it. Absolute truth, it's unchangeable. It exists above the fray of everyday life. We believe that God is the source of absolute truth. John 17, verses 15 to 19. I do not ask you take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself, that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. And sanctified means to be set apart for a holy purpose, which is based on God's word. And we covered sanctification in detail in episode 1108. What three steps will get us to heaven, part one? Go to ChristianQuestions.com or the CQ app and enter the episode number into the search bar. Because absolute truth is unchangeable, its lack of variation brings tremendous security. And that's something that we all like. Everybody likes security. Let, let's think of the sun as an example of an enduring absolute truth. From a human perspective, we know its schedule, the sun's schedule, down to the millisecond. It is as reliable as anything we can see regarding our planet Earth. It is a truth that we have faith in, and it is a truth that there's a reliability and that we trust. Even though the sun varies in distance from the earth, its unchangeable nature literally drives the comings and goings of our lives. It is steady. We know it. God's unchangeableness can be compared to this, 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 this reliability of the sun. But his reliability goes far beyond the sun's reliability. And Jonathan, before we go to the next scripture, I have a news flash for you. What's that? Did you know that the earth is every single year moving away from the sun. What? It's Real, a, really? It, it's a big deal. Yes, it, it's, it's, a, it's a scientific fact. I looked it up on lifescience.com. It is actually moving away from the sun. And now if I want to build my truth, I can tell you that, and I can create panic. I can say it's moving away from the sun. There's nothing we can do about it. It's getting further and further away. We have to do something. We have to do something. Well, well let, Rick, wait. God's got this, you know. 
Simmer down there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank you. Well, but here, here's the rest of the facts, Jonathan. While that's true, here are the facts. The Earth is moving away from the sun at the rate of, drum roll please, 2.36 inches per year. 2.36 inches per year. So when you consider that the, that the Earth, the, the distance of the Earth to the Sun varies by 3 million miles, depending on where it is in its orbit, 2.636 inches doesn't do a whole lot. As a matter of fact, let me give you a perspective on this. It would take, l- let's say you're going to be running a, a one-mile race. Okay. Okay, for most of us, one mile, that's a, you know, especially if you've got to run it, that's a, that's a big race. 30 million years... 30 million years of the Earth moving away from the sun at this rate would equal, at the starting line, moving your foot 1.5 inches. 30 million years. So you're right. God's got this. The point for bringing this up is sometimes we look at truth and we say, oh, we, we take it and we build something that's not meant to be built. Let's look at James 1, 17 to 18, in terms of God being compared to the sun. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and coming down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And variableness comes from two words. It means transmutation of phase or orbit that is figuratively fickleness. So it says that God is beyond the shadows that the sun casts. And God is beyond the variableness, the changing, the, 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 the fluctuation in the orbit. He's more steady than the sun. That's what the verse is telling us. And that's the most steady thing that we know on planet Earth. This is where you get a sense of what absolute truth is. Look at verse 18 from James 1. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Well, what a privilege. We're the first to understand pure truth from God's word. But let's not let it go to our heads. If there are first fruits, there are after fruits, meaning truth for others later in God's future kingdom. And we're looking at absolute truth now. We're beginning to develop that. And to do that, one more scripture to give us the sense of the, the surety of God. Lamentations three twenty two to 26. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never cease, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, have hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the person who seeks him. It is good that he waits silently for the salvation of the Lord. Great is God's faithfulness. It is always, always, always there. Tracking truth, what do we have? It is easy to create what we think is our own truth because of our social order encourages such things. We simply need to understand that we might consider to be my truth is simply my thoughts and emotions coming together and forming a set of personal values. Now, these values may or not harmonize with absolute truth. So... I must be willing to grow out of those values if I want to be closer to God and to have real truth in my life. I have to make choices about what I'm going to do with absolute truth, even if I have what I think is my truth. So we live on such a slippery slope when it comes to defining how we think our world should be. So let's focus on God's way, not mine. God is absolute truth. And we know he wants us to follow him. So how did he tell this to his human race? God's messages to us have been many, and they've been consistent. He started with the rules of obedience and blessings to Adam and Eve. He continued with guiding and directing individuals as as the general population of the world began creating their own truths. God then delivered the Mosaic Law to Israel. This law was written evidence of God's truth and humanity's role. So Jonathan, as we look at history and we look at God's absolute truth, we can see a pattern, a development of absolute truth in the lives of humanity. It started with Adam and Eve, but we're going to drop in to God's plan and his absolute truth with the law. The Apostle Paul sums up God's plan and his truth. Romans chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. 
Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For unto the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is the type of him who was to come. Well, the law was provided to be a measuring stick to learn what sin looks like. So this is a universal truth. Death reigned because of disobedience. And we're going to get to the law a little bit more in a, in a moment. But death reigned because of disobedience. And no, no, look, we could play God and say, okay, you end it right there. Death because of disobedience, it's over, it's done. But God's truth is bigger than any single circumstance. And we need to know that and we need to understand that. Now, let's go further. We've seen that death is, is there because of sin. What do we do with that? Galatians three nineteen to 21. Why the law then? It was added because of transgressions, having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed would come to whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not from one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law had been given which was able to impart life, then righteousness would indeed have been based on law. So now we have a development here, and here comes another universal truth. And again, this is from God's perspective that we're looking. Sinful humanity is not capable of living in harmony with God. The law was given, but man could not live up to it. We are not capable. Now you could end it right here. You could play God, say, well, you know what? We're not capable, so it's all over. It's going to be a bad ending. But God's truth is bigger than any circumstance. Rick, I really love the way our theme text sounds in the New Living Translation. Let me read that again. Psalm 119, 160. The very essence of your words is truth. All our just regulations will stand forever. You know, just regulations, right regulations, proper regulations will stand forever. To me, this is powerful. An everlasting truth. This is talking about the spirit of the truth. And this is the absolute truth of God. And it was revealed to humanity in stages. And we're unfolding those stages as we go through this now. Look, there are many examples of how humanity has, fall, has fallen short. Many, many examples. Israel's first king, King Saul, shows us how easily it was then, way back then, to create your own truth. King Saul had defeated the Amalekites but did not follow through with the instructions he was given to, and saved the choice cattle and so forth and so on. Samuel saw Saul's situational ethics at play and called him out. This is King Saul speaking. But the people took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choicest of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God at Gilgal. Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as an iniquity of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Well, Rick, this is a sin of rebellion, which is as the sin of divination. Saul is saying, I'm doing it my way. I'm king. I can justify my position by blaming others. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the problem. He blamed others, but it was him. He's the king. He's the final decision maker. And so, again, you look at this and you say, there's a universal truth expressed in this sin by King Saul. And that universal truth is our personal truth is likely in reality a sin against God. Because truth comes from above, not from within. Now, again, we can play God and say, okay, if that's the case, then we're all doomed and you can't have anything and life is going to die and it's all bad. But that's not God's truth. It's bigger than any single circumstances. So let's continue. We've looked at the sin of Adam. We looked at, looked at the law. We looked at an example of falling short. Now let's get back to Galatians and see the truth and the answer for our shortcomings unfold. Galatians 3, 22 to 24. But the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. 
But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Okay, another universal truth. Now, we've had several universal truths that have been labeling the difficulty and the challenge and the sadness and the rejection and the brokenness. Here's another universal truth. The only way for humanity to be in harmony with God is through the just sacrifice of Jesus. See, now we have something. God did not end it. He didn't say, well, it was too late, it was too bad, and I'm just going to let it go. He began truth's reign through the sacrifice of Jesus. He made it understandable in a small way that would expand as time goes on. Jesus is the gatekeeper to God and truth. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So, Let's continue. We've got Jesus now in the picture, and that changes everything. Justification by faith in this age only comes when we've been ransomed and given God's Spirit. Again, we're getting into more universal truths. This is John chapter 16, verse 13, and this is from the concordant version. Yet whenever that may be coming, the Spirit of truth, it will be guiding you into all the truth, for it will not be speaking for itself, but whatsoever it should be hearing, will it be speaking? And of what is coming, will it be informing you? So God's Spirit comes to be your guide for what? So you can see truth. Not your truth, not somebody else's truth, not traditional truth, but the truth of Scripture. Having God's Spirit is a key to abandoning our own truth to find and follow God's truth. A picture of Saul of Tarsus flashed in my mind. His truth was to persecute Christians for God. But when Jesus confronted him in the bright light on the road to Damascus, Jesus said, why are you doing this? Saul made a complete 180. He did. And once he made that turn, he began to teach absolute truth. And he went from teaching his own truth and the truth of the Pharisees to teaching God's absolute truth. Let's drop in on that in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, 14 to 18, but let's just do verse 14 to start. Remind them of these things and solemnly charge them in the presence of God not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. All right, not to wrangle about words. Why would we do this? Well, perhaps we might be confusing our truth with God's truth. Well, we have to be careful. We have to be careful. Perhaps, perhaps that's what's happening. Let's continue. 2 Timothy 2, 15 to 18. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it will lead to further ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene, among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, men who had gone astray from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they upset the faith of some. Accurately handling the word of God's word, absolute truth. That's what we're tasked with. And obviously, it's not the easiest thing to do. We have to rise up to a level of being able to do that. We are certainly tasked with keeping God's sacred word of truth we need to keep it sacred and separate from our own thinking. We can't allow those two things to mix. You know, Jonathan, earlier we talked about um, truth and values. Let's go to another soundbite that really gives a stark remembrance of the importance of separating higher truth from the values of a people because our values can lead us astray. This is, again, from Evangelism Explosion. Reasonable, reasonable answers to your truth is not my truth. At the end of World War II, the Nazis were put on trial for their crimes against humanity. The defense they used to justify their actions was that they were just following the German law of the land. Jews had no value. They were not considered persons under the law, and therefore, the taking of Jewish life was not a crime. Now, what did the prosecution use to combat this defense? They appealed to a natural law, a moral law, that all people have the right to life. 
They appealed to a truth that is universal, cross-cultural, that exists outside of whatever laws society may create. History shows us that when values replace truth and those values are taken to their end, mankind suffers horrific atrocities. So if it was a moral law that convicted the Nazis, there must be a moral law giver. And Jonathan, that's such a powerful reasoning for us to look at, for us to wrap our arms around and say, there is something bigger than little Rick and his little truth. There is, and we have to put things in perspective. Universal truth, humility is required every single step of our Christian walk. And let's look at Psalm 25, 4 to 7. Make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day. Remember, O Lord, your compassion and your loving kindness, for they will be have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressors. According to your loving kindness, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Well, Rick, this scripture is saying, I want God's truth to guide me every step of my way. So humility is required if we're going to follow God through Christ. Yeah, you don't say, make me know your ways, teach me your path, if you want to hang on to your own stuff. We need to be able to get rid of our stuff. That last soundbite, all of the scriptural reasoning, should be this warning sign to let go and let God. Let's rise higher than the things that our world is so tied up in. Tracking truth, Jonathan, what do we have? If we as Christians focus on that which comes from God and is higher than we are, we will be better enabled to dismantle our own, quote, my truth walls of self-promotion, end quote, and embrace God's absolute truths of life and peace. See, we build my truth walls of self-promotion. We build things around us and protect ourselves, and we feel kind of secure. We can't be doing that if we're Christians. Such a transformation away from this is not easy because it takes brutal honesty and spiritual courage. God's blessings will support us if we make this decision and follow after his truth. God's truth is broad and life-changing, while my truth is narrow and (laughs) self-preserving. That sounds like an easy decision. So obedience, God's law, and Jesus' ransom are fundamental absolute truths. Where does this all lead us to? The beauty of seeing all these details from our vantage point is remarkable. As Christians, we are living thousands of years after the Bible was written. And with the help of God's Spirit, we can see how all of these things fit into the larger picture. Now, let's simply let God's word of truth speak for itself and show us where His plan, where His truth is bringing us. Rick, again, what is truth? Let's look at just one account in which the Apostle Paul lays out several thrilling details of the truth which is found in God and expressed through his plan. So as we go through this account, we're going to go to the first chapter of Ephesians. We're going to see the details of God's plan just jump out of these scriptures. So we want to, as we go through it, track truth. Tracking truth, let's get started. The present spiritual blessings of true Christians are gracious gifts from God himself given through Jesus. Ephesians 1, 3 through 14 from the Weymouth translation. Let's begin with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has crowned us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ. So as we're looking and tracking truth, what does it start with? Blessed be God. And then it talks about our Lord Jesus, because God has crowned us. Think about this. In this in this ridiculous little physical, imperfect human life, he's crowned us with every spiritual blessing. How can that be? That's a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus. So let's go further. Tracking truth, what comes next? These loving and gracious gifts were all part of a master plan that God had in place from a time before time when God had, through Jesus, counteracted Satan's evil power and opened up the opportunity for a glorious sonship. Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. Even as, in his love, 
he chose us as his own in Christ before the creation of the world, that we might be holy and without blemish in his presence. For he predestined us to be adopted by himself as sons through Christ Jesus, being his gracious will and pleasure to the praise of the splendor of his grace and with which he has enriched us in the beloved one. One of the reasons we're using the Weymouth translation here is because it's so incredibly descriptive. It, it says in these verses, he chose us as his own, as his own in Christ, way back, way back before we were. He chose the true church to exist in his mind. It, it says that he adopted us by himself as sons through Jesus to become sons of God. How you can't get higher anywhere. These are absolute truths. And it says, such being his gracious will and pleasure. This is because God pours out his love and his grace and his wisdom and his power and his justice. It's all because he is so great. And it talks about describing it to the praise of the splendor of his grace. Jonathan, this is, this is breathtaking. And it gets bigger. It gets bigger. Our next point from Ephesians in Tracking Truth. This grand grace-driven plan of God's was all possible because Jesus freely gave himself as a ransom. This plan was not one known by everyone. Rather, it was known by a select few. Ephesians 1, 7 through 9. It is in him and through the shedding of his blood that we have our deliverance, the forgiveness of our offenses. So abundant was God's grace, the grace which he, the possessor of all wisdom and understanding, lavished upon us when he made known to us the secret of his will. And this is in harmony with God's merciful purpose. You think about that for a moment. You have this incredible plan, and he says, when he made known to us the secret of his will. This is something that wasn't general knowledge. There were hints throughout time, and until Jesus came and gave himself as a sacrifice, the unfolding of this wasn't clear. But it says, through the shedding of his blood, we have deliverance. That's the only way. Uh, this is abundant, abundant truth. This is abundant grace from God. He's the possessor of all wisdom and understanding, and he lavished this gift on us. He didn't have to. This is God in his absolute truth. Jonathan, it's big. It's magnificent. It deserves our attention. It deserves our focus. It deserves our loyalty. It deserves our all. And wait, it gets even better than this. Again, tracking truth, what's the next point? This plan would be known by everyone, but all in due time. Ephesians 1.10 God's merciful purpose for the government of the world when the times are ripe for it, the purpose which he has cherished in his own mind of restoring the whole creation to find its one head in Christ, yes, things in heaven and things on earth, to find their one head in him. So what this verse is saying is, you know, the, for the governments of the world when the times are ripe, will see Jesus as the head. So it shows us worldwide redemption. It shows us that, plain and simple. Interesting thing about the Weymouth translation in this verse. This translation adds the phrase, quote, the purpose which he has cherished in his own mind, unquote. Well, this, the, the Greek words now don't support this phrase. They don't support it. It's, it's not translatable from the words. We want to look at this phrase as an appropriate and added thought based on what the previous verses already said. God lavished upon us an understanding of an ages-long secret that was fundamental in bringing his plan to fruition. And so when, when Weymouth adds that phrase, he's, he's reiterating the beauty and, the, and the, the, the magnificence of God's plan. And I, I just think that's a... That is a wonderful, inspiring thought. You have this, and the governments, everybody is going to see Jesus as their head. That's beautiful. <laughs> it is. It is. But he doesn't stop. The apostle doesn't stop here. Let's track truth for the next piece. This amazing plan had given favor to the Jewish nation first, and those of that nation were first privileged to have the lineage and anticipation of Christ with them even before he came. Ephesians 1, 11 and 12. In him, we Jews have been made heirs, having been chosen beforehand in accordance with the intention of him whose might carries out in everything the design of his own will, 
so that we should be devoted to the extolling of his glorious attributes, we who are the first to fix our hopes on Christ. What a privilege it was for the Jews to be able to see him first. And they had that promise for thousands of years. They had that promise given to them right from the seed of Abraham, actually right from the sin of Adam. We won't go into all the details on that, but the promise was always there. And they were privileged to have Jesus be among them, to have Jesus be their kinsmen. They were privileged to be the first called. And that's what the apostle is saying. You see the beauty and the privilege that we as a nation have had? We've, we had Jesus right in our midst. Now, of course, when Jesus was there, Apostle Paul, not so much. He was, he was diametrically opposed to him. But you see his, his adulation over how God's plan unfolded. And once he understood it, boy, did he teach it. Let's go continue with Ephesians 1.13, tracking truth, what's coming next? Again, by grace, this amazing plan would open the door for people of all nations to have the privilege of God's own influence working in them. Ephesians 1.13, and in him you Gentiles also, after listening to the message of truth, the good news of your salvation, having believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Well, they were on the outside, but now they're not. So the Gentiles, by God's grace, by God's absolute truth, were given an opportunity to be exactly equal in opportunity with the Jewish nation for this heavenly calling. And it says they were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Jonathan, when you seal something and you're the king and it's sealed, that's it. It's that's fine. A done, it's a done deal. <laughs> it is. It is. And this is the absolute truth. Folks, when we look at God's absolute truth versus our little piddly truths that we protect ourselves with, we build those walls around us because I want to be able to say what I want to say. Look at God's absolute truth in relation to that and say, you got you to gotta, you gotta laugh at ourselves and say, wow, we really are off. Let's let the, take the walls down and let God's absolute truth help us cope with all aspects of our lives here and now. Last piece, we're going to go to Ephesians 1.14, tracking truth, what's it going to tell us? God's own influence in the individual lives of Christians was and is the guarantee of a heavenly inheritance for the purpose of glorifying God himself, Ephesians 1.14, that the Spirit being a pledge and foretaste of our inheritance in anticipation of its full redemption, the inheritance which he has purchased to be specially his for the extolling of his glory. So What an amazing plan, Rick. I'm sorry. So, so you're right. It is an amazing plan, and here's what it says. The Spirit being a pledge, a foretaste of our inheritance— Think about God's Spirit. You know, you have the, the, the picture of the body or, 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 or Christ, the, the bridegroom and the bride being the church. Think of the Holy Spirit as the engagement ring that Jesus gives to the church. This is his promise of being the, 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 the bride, the promise. It's saying, I will not forsake you. This is my promise. God's Spirit is that promise. That's how big it is. That's the absolute truth what God's plan is. And folks, whatever your truth you think may be, it cannot hold a candle to the burning flame of the light that we see here. So let's go back to where we started. Remember we were talking about Jesus and Pilate? Well, Jesus told Pilate that his kingdom was, quote, not of this world, unquote. Jesus knew that the truth of God's ultimate plan was for a new heavens, a new system of governing, and a new earth, a renewed environment for humanity. Jesus was and is given dominion over that world. And you know what? That is the truth. Let's look at a prophecy, just one prophecy in relation to this. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Amen. <laughs> to God be the glory. <laughs> His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Folks, that's absolute truth. 
let's not fool ourselves when we look at ourselves. Let's look at the scriptures and say, God's plan, God's truth, God's way, God's will, God's power, God's wisdom, it's all bigger than we are. One last tracking of truth, Jonathan, let's wrap this up. Let us let go of all forms of my truth and choose to instead cling to only God's absolute truth, which is found in the Bible. Salvation for all coupled with eternal peace and harmony are pretty big truths to bank on. Anything less than God's truth is not only temporary, it is incomplete and dis- destined to disappoint. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Not my truth shall set me free. God's truth will set us free if we are willing to put God's truth before us no matter what. Folks, we've been looking at this subject of truth, and we are stuck in our world, in this, in this fiction of having our own truths and banking on them and demanding respect. Rather, we should say, these are beliefs. Let's look higher. Let's look outside of ourselves because God's truth comes down from above and will bless all mankind. You can't get a better absolute truth than that. Think about it. Folks, we love hearing from our listeners. We welcome your feedback and questions on this episode and other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Coming up in our next episode, how strong are my relationships? Part one. Talk to you then. <laughs>